Welcome. We are so glad that you've joined us today for our Winter Lunch and Learn series. I'm Tammy Thompson, Outreach and Conference Manager for Deep Roots, and I am delighted to spend the next hour with you all. Thank you for joining us. We return this month with our final broadcast of our five-part beginner slash refresher series. In 2022, in coordination with the Mid-America Regional Council and the Health Forward Foundation, Deep Roots developed a series of foundational webinars for beginning Native gardeners and folks looking to fill in knowledge gaps or brush up on their skills, just like me. I'm delighted to roll out the last in our series today. We finished this series strong with a, a roundtable at the end of this at the end of this broadcast of subject matter experts to help us put it kind of put it all together. Before I talk about today's topic and introduce our speaker, I want to make just a few announcements. First of all, we are incredibly grateful to the Mid-America Regional Council and the Health Forward Foundation for their generous sponsorship of this series. We are also grateful to you for your support of Deep Roots, our programs, and our webinars. This webinar will be recorded and up on the Deep Roots website by Monday. You will also receive an email with that link and any resources that are mentioned during the broadcast today. And, and there will be a lot of resources, so please look for those. So watch your email and our website. And also, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll be notified each time we upload a new video. So far in this series, we've covered your yard's place in the ecosystem, digging up the dirt on healthy soils, planning your native garden project and DIY native garden design. All of those recordings are already up on our website along with the resources that support them. Today, we are honored to have, again, our Deep Roots alum, Sarah Beyer, lead us through native garden management made simple. That's the critical part, made simple. The maintenance of native gardens is one of the most essential elements. So we are thrilled to close out this series today discussing the most effective methods to use when you're creating your garden and also when you're just maintaining it. So all those steps that are critical in managing it. And at the end of today's broadcast, we will bring together three subject matter experts to help us navigate all of the questions that we have been gathering over the series so far. So let's get this party started right now. During the program, put your questions in the Q&A tool on Zoom, and we will get to as many of those at the end of the broadcast as possible. I will use the chat feature to share links or other information shared by our speakers, and feel free to chat with each other as well. So with that, I am honored to introduce our speaker today. Sarah Beyer is a Deep Roots alum and owner of Oak and IO Garden Consultants. Most of you know Sarah for her years behind this series and her time at Deep Roots and know that she is certainly a credible authority in this space. So give me a couple of seconds and I'll roll tape. Hello and welcome to the final installment in our Native Landscaping webinar series. My name is Sarah Beyer. I'm a Native Landscape Consultant with Oak and Io. This series has been a cooperative project between Mid-America Regional Council and Deep Roots KC with generous underwriting support from the Health Forward Foundation. Today we're going to talk about managing your Native landscape, your native garden. We're going to talk about um, what to do and when and how to get the most enjoyment and the most benefit out of your garden year round. So let's dig right in. 
Okay, just a quick overview of our topics before we get started. Um, we're going to divide our time again into three sections. Uh, we'll briefly cover when and how to plant. We'll talk about being in a management mindset, and then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of seasonal management and what you need to do year round. So it's time to put plants in the ground. Finally, we've arrived at the fun part. So when can I plant native plants? The best time to plant native plants is in the fall and the spring. Um, the temperatures are cooler during these times. It's a great time for root development, um, particularly in the spring. You have the best selection available of native plants at our native nurseries. Um, you uh, have our pop-up plant sales happening around town during that time. Um, summer is possible, um, but it, it does put the plants through a lot of stress during the hottest part of the year. Um, so those cooler times in the fall and spring are often the best. It allows the plants to have a little bit of cooler weather, cooler evenings, especially uh, if it does get hot during the day, they get a little bit of a break um, and a chance to get established before having to deal with the um, sometimes rough conditions of the summer or the winter. Um, uh, this all assumes that you're using plants though and not seeds. If you do want to start your native plants from seeds, please take a look at the links that come along with this video. Um, I'll have some information in there about wintertime sowing of native plants um, because that is the, the ideal time to do that. Do pay attention to the weather conditions. If the soil is too wet, um, you do want to wait till it dries out a bit rather than trying to work through it. Um, likewise, soil that is too dry can be difficult to dig through. Um, that's definitely preferable though to working uh, with really saturated ground. Um, I like to time planting for just before a rainy period. Um, it saves me some time and effort on watering uh, in those first few days uh, right after the plants have gone into the ground. Um, and just definitely try not to plant before a heat wave uh, if you can avoid it. The plants lose so much water, the root systems just aren't developed beyond the limitations of where they were in that pot. It takes some time for them to develop uh, a larger root system to be able to reach more water. So um, it's just a lot of stress on the plant uh, during that time. So how do I plant? Um, if you've planted a garden before, the process isn't any different, but in case you've never done it, we'll um, just run through it really quickly. So the first thing you want to do is lay out your plants. So we want to lay out the entire garden, every single plant before we put a single plant in the ground, just set them in their places. Uh, and then kind of stand back and look around and make sure that things are where you want them. If your design includes a lot of straight lines like this one, you might want to set up uh, some stakes with guidelines uh, to help you lay out those plants in the straight lines as you want them. Uh, here you see the process during the planting of the Monarch Demonstration Garden at Loose Park. Another idea, this one also from Loose Park, is uh, designs that call for accuracy. This uh, is another design by Alan Branhagen, um, which includes uh, sedges that are to be planted at one foot intervals on a grid. Um, and so in this case, we used this template um, with holes cut every one foot and a little sprinkle of flower to mark where each plant goes. And then as you can see, they've been laid out um, plants on their places. But this is by far the most popular method. Um, just place them where they're going to go uh, and then stand back, take a look, um, adjust things as needed, and then you can just start planting them once everybody is in place. Um, you'll just dig a hole roughly the same size as the pot. You can use a garden trowel for this. I like to plant with a Japanese hori hori knife that's shown uh, in the upper left there. Um, but you can also, even if you have a lot of plants to plant, uh, get this uh, drill bit auger type thing um, on a cordless drill and use that to um, really quickly make your holes. You probably bought your plants in pots that look like what's on the left. Um, and in order to remove those, you just kind of squeeze the opposite sides uh, and go around the pot and just sort of loosen it up. Um, and then gently supporting the plant with your fingers, turn it over um, and let the pot release. Um, and then you can put it in the ground. Um, what's on the right are landscape plugs that come in a tray that's all connected together. Um, you can remove those by sort of pushing from the bottom and then just sort of gently wiggling the plant out uh, and putting them into place. You wanna tuck them into the ground at the same height that the plant was in the pot and um, kind of secure it in, pat the loose uh, soil around and you're good to go. Shrubs and trees have a little bit different needs uh, in terms of how big you're going to dig the hole um, and how you're going to plant them. Um, so I'll include some materials uh, for you there along with the links that accompany this webinar. 
And once you're done planting, we need to take care of them. So the first thing um, we're gonna do is mulch. Um, a lot of people do use mulch for the first year or two in establishing a native garden. I think that's absolutely fine, um, especially if you're limited on time and the alternative is letting a bunch of weeds get established that you're gonna have to fight for a long time. Um, mulch is absolutely not a sin. Um, so, uh, you can either mulch afterwards and tuck it in around the plants. I know some people that like to mulch first and then plant through the mulch and just kind of clear the spots away. You do want to make sure if you're doing that, that you're not incorporating um, much of the wood chips or the mulch down into the holes. Um, having those decaying next to the roots can be detrimental to the plants. So um, just there's pros and cons of doing it each way. Plants do need to be watered right after planting, give them a good long drink, and then you'll need to keep watering uh, for a little while. So using this three, two, one rule, uh, we're gonna water three times in the first week, two times in the second week. Uh, and then if you planted in the fall, once per week until a hard freeze. Um, if you've planted in the spring, you're gonna do once per week um, until we get through that really stressful heat of the summer. Um, and you may even do a little bit of extra in droughty times. Just kind of look at your plants um, and see uh, what they're telling you they need. So talking a little bit now about um, getting into a management mindset. Um, so why are we using the word management and not maintenance? Um, and part of that is just the connotation around those words. When we think about maintenance, that's the process of preserving, of continuing in its current state. Uh, you might maintain a classic car in a way that attempts to keep everything in as close to its original condition as possible. Management, on the other hand, is um, the process of influencing, of supervising, or guiding a process. Um, think about managing a project. So the goal is to steer the direction. You're going to react to situations uh, as they come up, um, adjust as needed. Uh, the end result is ideally going to be really different from the raw materials that you started with, and that's a good thing. Um, so when we think about gardening uh, in this way of uh, as managers um, rather than maintainers, uh, I like this idea. A landscape architect once told me that gardening is a conversation. I think this is a really useful and beautiful metaphor. Um, it implies this like give and take between the gardener and the plants, as well as between the plants with each other and with the weather conditions and the, the critters and the insects and the pollinators. Um, I think it's just a really nice way to think about it. Um, so this looks like uh, being alert to you and responding to the needs of the plants, um, which might look like watering our new gardens regularly, um, pruning a damaged branch, removing weeds, um, watching out for any wilty or droopiness, um, and observing the habits of the plants, uh, either encouraging or editing as a result. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, when to encourage and when you might choose to edit as we go along. Um, and just being willing to accept that the design is going to change and embrace embrace that as part of the beauty of inviting nature into the garden and of working with uh, working with these plants that um, have preferences and have um, places where they're more ideally suited uh, and that they're going to kind of find those on their own and we can make our, our best guesses as to where they will be happy. Um, but ultimately, we're going to uh, be listening and engaging in that conversation. Another thing that's helpful to think about is your why. Um, you may have heard of the concept of starting with why. Uh, so we wanna find our why. Why are we choosing to garden with native plants? So you may be looking at the, um, the wildlife, the ecological value. These are the functional ecosystem services um, that we talked about in some of our first couple webinars, uh, the plants providing for the insects, the insects providing for the birds, um, and just being that base layer. Uh, of our trophic pyramid. You may be um, primarily choosing natives for the aesthetics, for the beauty, for the color, the seasonal changes, the sense of place that you can only get from using the plants that are native to your area. Um, you might be looking at climate change resistance. Maybe you're wanting to improve soil health to store more carbon, combat climate change. You might be um, interested for the decreased inputs. Maybe you wanna spend less time fertilizing and babying plants that weren't meant to grow in your yard anyway. Um, likely you're some combination of all of the above, but maybe there's one that resonates or sticks out to you more than the others. Um, and that's your why. So when in doubt, come back to your why and let it inform your decisions.
Okay, so jumping right in, uh, making some of those decisions and looking ahead. Um, we're going to go through the year and talk about what's happening in the garden during each period. Uh, we'll talk about your garden to-do list for each season. Uh, and because my why is about providing for wildlife and attracting uh, them to my garden, uh, I'm going to share with you some fun critters you can be on the lookout for in each season, um, as well as some bird friendly tips because caring for songbirds that visit the garden is a big part of my desire uh, to garden with native plants as well. So we'll talk about some things that you can do to help keep those avian visitors from harm uh, when they visit your garden. I recommend uh, creating a garden notebook. Uh, at the very least, keep track of what you do and when. Um, if you're so inclined, though, you can expand this to be something of a naturalist notebook and include sketches of plants, sketches of wildlife, notes about the wildlife you see visiting the garden. When um, do you see the first monarch of the year? Um, when do you see the last caterpillar of the year? Those sorts of things. Um, these little nature notes books are great for that. They're available from the Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, either in the MDC Nature Shop online or at nature centers. So late winter, looking at January and February here, um, the garden looks, uh, we've got a lot of standing stems, seed heads, uh, great winter interest, especially with the snow uh, on the caps of these little rutabecchias here, uh, or Black Eyed Susans. Um, in this season, our garden tasks are, first we're gonna take inventory of our tools, um, sharpen blades, repair or replace things as needed. This is also the time to prune your shrubs and trees. You do wanna make sure you do your homework um, to protect blooms. The dogwood shown here blooms on last year's wood. So if you trim before it's bloomed in the spring, uh, you're gonna lose those flowers. Uh, other shrubs bloom on new growth and pruning in the late winter will be just fine. So um, again, I'll have some links and some more information uh, along with the video to help you include or help you figure out which option is best for your plants. For the birds in this season, uh, if you have bird baths or feeders, get them cleaned and sanitized, and it's important to continue to do that throughout the year. Uh, while we're outside, take a moment to evaluate the placement of feeders uh, and take steps to avoid bird strikes on windows. And I'll have information on all, all of the bird tips we'll talk about. Uh, I'll include some extra information for um, more uh, places to go to learn in the links that come along with the video as well. In this season, um, we can watch for the earliest blooms. This is a vernal witch hazel up on the left there. It is the first native plant to bloom in the Kansas City area of the year. Um, you can look for it in February and watch for these teeny tiny little flying insects, little tiny pollinators um, that visit the flowers. You can also see Adult butterflies on warm winter days, we have just a handful of species in Kansas City that overwinter as adults. Um, the one shown here is a morning cloak. Um, and of course, watch for birds feeding on the winter seeds and berries in the garden. In early spring, coming into March and April, the garden is waking up. We've got some shrubs in bloom, like the golden currant seen on the left. We've got spring ephemerals blooming. Those are plants that bloom in the spring and then die back completely to the ground, so you won't see the plant at all until next year. Uh, the bloodroot in the bottom right-hand corner is a good example of that. Um, there's also trout lily and the bluebells at the top. Um, you might also see pussy toes, wild sweet william, golden groundsel, um, and we're seeing the green tops of other perennials that will bloom later in the year coming out during this time. Garden tasks at this time of year, we're gonna start weeding. So what's a weed? A weed is just a plant out of place. There's no specific definition for these are weeds and these are not. Um, so for you, a weed might be a non-native um, little weedy annual plant. It might be a seedling of a native plant that you've planted, but you don't want more of. Um, on our screen here, um, we have common violets on the left, uh, which I leave when they pop up. They're free ground cover, um, they're good bee food, um, and they're easy to thin out when needed. Um, the others shown here are generally considered weeds and most people will, re will remove them. So going clockwise from the little blue flowers, we have chickweed, um, henbit, dead nettle, and of course dandelions. So um, a weed is just a plant out of place, something that you don't want where it's growing. 
Please do, though, remove invasive species. If you have those present in your garden or on your property, look for garlic mustard, exotic honeysuckles, um, English ivy, also uh, winter creeper, um, a link to some invasive species identification tools uh, for you um, so that when in doubt, you can uh, check those and make sure that you do remove those as those do cause ecological and financial harm. As I said, I leave the violets. Uh, they're a native nectar source that comes out early, good for the bees. Um, and when in doubt, wait a little bit. So in the photo here, the image on the left is a seedling blazing star, which could be difficult to tell from some of the things that you might weed out. So if you have, you know, stray grasses that pop up in your garden and you're pulling those, um, you might pull something like this uh, on accident. So um, it's important to kind of learn your weeds or learn what your native ID, native seedlings look like. Um, and when in doubt, just wait a couple of weeks and see if you get some more clues as it uh, gets a little bit bigger. Um, and you can always check in later and um, see what it looks like then. Also in the season, we're going to cut back winter stems. Um, so uh, this slide is packed with a lot of information. Um, all of these images are taken from a really great publication by the Xerces Society uh, that I'll have a link to uh, as well. So. Um, you can see that the dry standing stems of plants are a really valuable resource for these little beneficial insects. They use them to lay eggs in and protect their larva over the winter. Um, we're going to leave those stems standing and then in the spring, you can cut them back. So leaving a foot or so uh, standing for the bees to find um, when they emerge. Uh, a lot of folks say you should wait to do this and they'll tell the temperatures are consistently 50 degrees or so. Um, I'm not sure that we have any like real good answers informed by solid science on when uh, it's okay to cut back. Um, just don't be in a rush. Let it wait if it can. And if it can't, um, you can take what you cut back and um, maybe put it underneath some shrubs or something like that. So it's not necessarily um, removing it from the property and giving uh, the little critters inside maybe the best chance uh, to complete their winter cycle. Um, so what do I do with what I cut? You can uh, leave it in the garden. You can remove it to the compost pile. Or like I said, you can spread it under some shrubs. Or if you have a little um, sort of brush pile type area um, somewhere on the property, um, leaving it in the garden is just fine. If you have a light layer, um, you don't want to leave uh, a lot, a lot of material um, in, the, in and around the, uh, the crowns of the, the new plants. During this time, we can also do a gentle garden cleanup. Um, and when I say gentle cleanup, I'm talking about maybe raking out some of the fall leaves, especially if you have prairie plants or areas where the leaves tend to gather really thick and wet. Um, we have silver maples and in some of the little corners and things where those can really pile up, they just compact down. And sometimes by the spring, there's just a thick wet layer there um, that that can smother um, some of our, our more delicate plants, especially plants that are more adapted to being uh, in the prairie versus in a, a yard where they have maple leaves falling on them. So um, again, what you remove can go into the compost pile. You can spread it under shrubs, toss it in a brush pile type area. What you don't want to do is bag it up and send it away. Um, keep those nutrients and the, any critters that are taking shelter in the leaves on your property, help nourish it, help um, keep that vibrant life there for the next year. For the birds in the season, um, we're going to turn off our outdoor lights during the spring migration. Um, we have millions of birds migrating through the Kansas City area during the spring and again during the fall. Um, most of our songbirds migrate at night, which you may not realize, and nighttime lights are disorienting uh, and they can really cause some serious harm and interfere with the bird's ability to navigate. The image on the left here is from Tracy Aviary um, and shows some ways that you can help at the bottom. I like this uh, diagram that just shows that the that harsh uh, bluish and white lights uh, are the, the worst in terms of harming birds at night. Um, if you can shift to warmer toned lights, um, shield the lights so that they are directing the light downward only and um, not out into the sky uh, and put them on motion sensors if you can. Uh, the absolute best is if you can during the um, spring months and fall months to turn those lights off. 
Um, for us locally here in Kansas City, I recommend following Lights Out Heartland um, as well as your local Audubon Society. Um, sometimes there will even be an alert during certain nights on the spring uh, and fall migrations to let you know we have you know, thousands of birds moving through the area in the next couple of nights um, that they're tracking and can let you know uh, which nights are particularly critical to leave those outdoor lights off. During this season, we are watching for birds establishing territory, um, maybe gathering some nesting materials in the garden. We have lots of migratory birds coming through, uh, like the warbler in the center top photo or the hermit thrush in the bottom left um, that you may get lucky enough to see as they make their way through. We also have our queen bumblebees. Uh, they overwinter as adult bees. Um, just the just the new queens will do that. Um, and they spend that winter underneath this insulative cover of um, our fallen leaves. So um, they are coming out in the spring and uh, looking to restart their colonies. Another reason not to rush that cleanup and to be gentle about it when you do um, need to remove those leaves. Also, our hummingbirds return showing up uh, around mid-April in the Kansas City area. So these are all things that you can hope to observe while you're out tending your garden. And that brings us into late spring and early summer. The garden is looking fresh, bright green. Um, spring shrubs and trees are blooming. We have um, nine barks blooming. There's hydrangea here in the bottom left. Um, early summer wildflowers or milkweeds are starting to bloom. Uh, purple poppy mallow. Um, we've got this yellow Missouri primrose and the blue wild indigo. Coneflowers are starting to bloom that will keep blooming throughout the next couple of months. During this time, our garden tasks, uh, we're going to share the wealth. So we're going to learn to recognize the seedlings of the perennials in our garden um, and remove those seedlings that you don't want. Either transplant them to another um, location of the garden or another bed um, or give them away to friends. Remember that we are managers, not maintainers. So consider your goals before moving or removing plants. So some plants are not individually long lived in the garden. Each individual plant doesn't live for many, many years, um, but, uh, but they do reseed. So uh, in my opinion, these are nearly always allowed to reseed uh, and to spread. So um, rose verbena, the individual plants don't live very long, but it reseeds when it's in a happy spot. Um, it will continue to stay there. Uh, because it's kind of constantly seeding those new uh, little babies. Um, blazing stars are the same way. Um, the squirrels also tend to steal them. So uh, I always let my blazing stars reseed whenever I have babies. They're welcome to stay. And I mean, how could you uh, turn down a, a plant that looks like that? Uh, and then the rutabacchias are the black eyed Susans. Um, also are not individually very long lived as a perennial plant. Um, they live for a few years. Um, so I do also let them reseed because I do still want that um, aspect uh, to continue in the garden and um, brighten my days. Some uh, plants, however, are prolific reseeders and should nearly always be edited out, particularly in the early years uh, of a garden, if you are just getting things established and you don't want these guys to take up too much room, then we're going to edit out those seedlings um, more often uh, as we get going. So um, asters are the common milkweed that's shown here, our golden rods, golden alexander, and obedient plant are just a few examples of some of those um, aggressive reseeders. So this is just a reason to do your homework on each plant that you select for your garden um, so that you can kind of make some of those decisions about whether you're going to be vigilant about removing seedlings or removing seed heads um, or not, uh, depending on the species. Also during this period, we can cut back those late season bloomers, things that don't bloom until the fall. We're going to remove one third to one half of the total height of the plant. Um, and we can do this twice. You can do it once in May and once in June. Um, but make your final cuts by early July. July 4th is kind of the easy to remember rule of thumb so that they have enough time to generate the buds uh, to form the flowers that we want to see later in the year. Um, this creates a more compact, uh, bushier shape, um, gives us more blooms, um, and 
you can make some notes about this. This is one of those things. Be sure to write down what you cut by about how much and what date you did it. And um, then reevaluate in the fall and make uh, changes if needed for next, next year. For the birds, we're going to clean and change feeders frequently. If you feed hummingbirds, consider planting hummingbird friendly flowers for fuss free feeding. Um, say that three times fast. <laughs> this is a red buckeye. Uh, it starts blooming about the time that hummingbirds show up in the spring. They really like tubular flowers. And of course, red is always a winner with hummingbirds. Um, and you don't have to clean this. Uh, so I enjoy it um, as I am not good about uh, cleaning those hummingbird feeders. So I prefer to feed them with plants so that I know that I'm not going to accidentally cause any harm. In this season, we're going to watch for birds feeding nestlings. We may get some fledglings hopping around the yard. Um, you can look for evidence of leafcutter bees. These little circular holes near the margins of the leaves are uh, made by female leafcutter bees who cut off a little cap uh, of the leaf and use it to cover the holes where they have laid their eggs to kind of seal off each section with a little leaf cap. Um, also during this time, Fireflies emerge. This is another great reason to go ahead and leave those outdoor lights off in the summer as well. Fireflies need to be able to see each other flashing and it's hard for them to do that if you've got um, outdoor lights on. Um, fireflies also need those leaves to stay on the ground. They need that leaf litter um, and a little bit of decaying log in, in general, just not to keep your yard too tidy and maybe to designate a natural area or to have a, a, a brush pile, something along those lines. So. Coming into summer um, in July and August, we have ironweeds and rattlesnake master blooming. We've got compass plant, our coreopsis, um, sunflowers, phlox, joe pie weed. The pollinators are busy, busy, busy during this time. And we're going to be busy too. So we're going to continue weeding as needed. Um, our summer annual weeds include starting at the left here, spurge, lamb's quarters, black medic and mare's tail. Again, I'll have some uh, weed ID resources for you in the links. We're gonna stake or support any flopping plants. So if you've got a few that are kind of leaning over, um, we are gonna try to get them standing up straight or at least out of pathways, things like that. Um, a note that good design can help prevent this if you pair tall blooms with other tall plants and grasses around them for support. Kind of remember how nature does it. Um, plants packed into together, they're leaning on each other, uh, but also just in the early years, it's a little bit difficult to prevent this entirely. So um, it may improve over time. Blazing stars especially tend to get a little squirrely in the first couple of years, um, and they can sometimes get, uh, you know, leaning over too far or kind of, look twisty. Um, it's kind of a neat look actually. Uh, but anyway, you can kind of stake those up. Um, often it will improve as they get older and send up more um, stems that are a, a little bit sturdier. Um, you can use sticks. Um, you can use commercial garden stakes. You can use tomato cages. Um, this kind of one-sided support it's called like a half round plant support um, can be great for something that's just kind of leaning out on one side and you just want to rein it in a little bit or get it off of a walkway, things like that. Um, you can always clip off to uh, stems that are um, too floppy. We're also going to tend to the seed heads of spring bloomers and whether you remove or allow to remain uh, any individual um, seed head may depend uh, again on your goals. So go back to your why um, and let that help inform your decision. Also consider the age of the garden. So in the first couple of years, you may want to be more vigilant about removing aggressive uh, reseeders to, to clip off those seed heads before they can fall. Um, and then once competition is stiffer, uh, then you may be a little bit more relaxed about it. And your decisions may be different for some plants versus others. Uh, so I love penstemons. This is penstemon digitalis or foxglove beard tongue on the left there. Um, I want them to make a big visual impact and they seem to be popular with my deer. So um, since I lose a few to the deer every year, uh, I, I let those reseed always. If they make it long enough to produce a seed head, um, then I let them go. Uh, I want lots of those in my garden. On the other hand, I'm really happy with my current density of golden Alexanders, uh, and they can get dense. 
uh, for sure. It is a very enthusiastic reseeder. And so I generally just cut the flowers off after they've faded, after the pollinators have visited, but before the plant can make mature seeds. So I'm not removing a resource uh, that the pollinators need, um, but I am gonna go ahead and clip those off um, because they can overrun some of the things that they're uh, close to in the garden. So um, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, during this time, we're going to turn off outdoor lights for the fall migration, which starts in Kansas City around the middle of August and continues through the fall. During the season, we can watch for goldfinches building nests. They nest later than most songbirds, um, so they're busy during this time. Um, also look for caterpillars and not just monarchs, which are pictured in the top there, and they're very special and we do love them, um, but all kinds of caterpillars. So um, some of the signs you can look for are um, eggs on leaves. Um, you can look for holes in the leaves or sometimes uh, they will kind of seal up a leaf to make a, a little folded leaf, a little leaf taco. Um, the swallowtail there at the bottom may do that. Um, you can look for frass, F-R-A-S-S. -S. That is uh, caterpillar poop, um, which is pictured in the bottom right there. But looking around plants, if you find some of that, like start looking underneath the leaves and uh, see what you can find. Um, if you check the blooms of cone flowers, you might be lucky enough to spot a camouflage looper, which is pictured in the top right there. They actually um, nip off little bits of the petals of the flower uh, that they are living on and use it to adorn themselves as um, camouflage. So those are really fun to find and kids especially like looking for those. Bringing us into late summer, early fall, this is yellow and purple season in the garden. We've got asters and goldenrods galore, um, gentians, which are down in the bottom there, dittany is purple, um, our blazing stars in the top. We've got um, spring and summer early bloomers, the foliage is starting to fade. Um, fall color is present in the trees, beginning to show in the garden. Um, just really, really gorgeous colors during this time. So it's a great time to be out. Um, we're gonna continue weeding as needed, um, just anything that we happen to find. For me, a uh, honey vine is an all season weed for me. Um, it is native, it is a milkweed. You may have it in your garden as well. Um, and monarchs will lay eggs on it. Uh, however, it's just extremely difficult to control once it's established and um, it comes back year after year. It has a really long taproot and it will climb over other plants and overwhelm them. So um, I have plenty of other less aggressive milkweeds. And since I plant for all of my native neighbors and not just for monarchs, I do pull this when I see it. And that process continues into the fall. This is a great time to plant native plants, uh, especially shrubs and trees. Um, they have a chance to really get that root development in uh, before the next spring. This is a good time to divide plants as needed, um, do that in September um, and get them nice and settled in before the really cold weather arrives so that they can be ready for the spring. We're going to clean and store our tools for the winter. We're gonna leave the leaves as much as we possibly can. Um, here is a slide with lots of examples from the Xerces Society uh, for Invertebrate Conservation um, of different examples illustrating what lies in the leaves. So um, there may be chrysalises uh, of, this is a swallowtail in the upper left, um, the luna moth overwinters as a chrysalis in the leaves. Um, down in the bottom left, there is a now empty uh, cocoon from a um, cecropia moth. Uh, again, we have our queen bumblebees relying on that leaf litter for insulation. Um, and it's adding a lot of nutrients down into the soil. So as much as possible, we're gonna leave the leaves. It's definitely okay to clean up walkways. It's definitely okay to remove some where you need to. We talked back in our very first episode about um, finding that continuum between picking up every single leaf and leaving every single leaf. And some people are gonna be at one end of the spectrum. We know there are other people at the other end of the spectrum. Most of us are gonna fall somewhere in between. So just think about where you fall. And again, go back to your why. We're also going to leave the stems and we've talked about why that's important. Um, and you've got the winter beauty, um, you've got the birds that will visit, you've got those stems standing, um, and then we can cut them back in the spring to uh, leave those natural cavities uh, for our stem and nesting bees. 
for the birds in the season, if you have birdhouses or nest boxes, now is the time that you can clean them out. The birds can also do that, um, but uh, this is a good time to check them and uh, make sure everything is still in working order and that they are safe and ready to go for next year. During this season, we're gonna watch for more caterpillars. We're gonna watch for migrating monarchs. The monarch migration in the fall peaks in uh, late September in Kansas City, um, where you'll see the largest numbers of them coming through. Make sure that your planting list includes uh, blazing stars, includes goldenrods, includes asters, those three plants across the top there, uh, for them to be able to find that nectar that they need to fuel their journey. Um, you can also during this time find sleepy bees uh, in the mornings before the sun hits them. Um, if you go out into the garden, look around, you may find them curled up in flowers like this. And finally, bringing us into late fall, early winter, November, December. Um, during this time, the garden reminds us that brown is a color too. Um, We've got shades from tan to rust to golden yellow. Um, berries contrast with the snow and draw in birds. Um, we've got the seed heads, which look really great and also continue to help feed wildlife over the winter. Um, the last blooms of the year are gonna come uh, from Ozark witch hazel, uh, a different witch hazel that blooms um, sometimes as late as December. And in the middle here, these are frost flowers, uh, and these form on species of crown beard or dittany when the first hard freezes force that extra moisture up out, back out of the stems um, and get these really beautiful uh, formations in the morning. During this time, we've got just a few garden tasks. We're gonna to continue to water new plants during drought, which we happens during the winter as well. We don't notice it as much sometimes, but um, we need to be aware of that, especially before a cold snap um, to make sure that we've got some water into the plants to help them through the winter. Um, we wanna water new trees and shrubs year round for at least three years. Um, and I'll have some information on uh, some easy ways to do that for you in the links. We're gonna review our garden notebook, figure out what worked well, what we would like to do differently next year, and we're gonna plan new gardens. For the birds during this time, provide unfrozen wet water during the winter months, whether that's a heated bird bath, um, we can watch for them coming to enjoy that. Also um, look for these ground feeding dark eyed jenkos in the bottom corner there. Um, I always love seeing evidence that little birds have been through in the snow. Um, and again, on warm winter days, you might see butterflies like this question mark uh, butterfly flying around looking for tree sap to drink. Um, it is a great time of year to have a nice view out the window and a warm drink and think about doing it all over again next year. All right, if you would like to learn more about any of the things that we talked about today, please check out the supplemental resources and the links that go along with them. You can find that at Mid-America Regional Council or Deep Roots websites at mark.org or deeproots.org. Again, I always recommend the Planet Native Conference as an excellent place to take the next step in learning about native landscaping. Whether you're a beginner or a professional, you will find something there that is accessible and educational to you. If you have questions about this series, um, please contact Deep Roots or Mid-America Regional Council at the information on your screen. It has been an absolute pleasure to present these, and I hope that you have enjoyed them and found them useful. Uh, and again, we want to give a big thanks to the Health Forward Foundation for their support of this series. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Well, welcome back. That was outstanding. Um, I have a hard time kind of getting back in the role of hosting after I get to watch something uh, so informative. Uh, thank you all for sticking with us. We are going to hit our panel now. I know you all have waited. This is the fifth. Um, this is the fifth episode of our beginner slash refresher series. And I am um, I know you all have questions. We've got, it looks like a full chat. We've got a Q&A rolling. So, um, so I will introduce our panel. You all panel members, go ahead and come on screen and I'll just introduce you one at a time. 
All right, there's Sarah. I think most of you have gotten to know Sarah Byer by now. She is um, a Deep Roots alum, like I've mentioned, um, made it very scary for me to think I might possibly try to take over her role here. Uh, and you all have had five episodes to see what Sarah can do. Sarah can do everything. She can explain it in a way in 30 minutes. She can explain a topic and um, you all have, have had a chance to see how credible Sarah is. Uh, she owns a consulting business right now. She has a long history of wildlife biology, native plants, and she's just the master. So I'm fangirling over here right now with Sarah. So Sarah, wave to the to the folks like they didn't know who you were. Our next panelist is Roberta Vogel Loyton. I always want to screw up your name. I'm sorry, Roberta. Roberta, again, I'm fangirling here too. Uh, Roberta, often like Madonna, known only by her first name, most of us know her as Roberta, is, a reti is retired from a 35 year career at the intersection of environment and community engagement and has been using some of her, we'll just call it retirement time to amplify her personal native home landscape, spread the wealth by growing plants for community projects and installing pollinator gardens inside urban community garden projects. Currently, she is immersed in training and practice of warm data labs and people need people, which brings people together to practice perception and acting inside the dynamism of living systems. So wave to the crowd, Roberta. And our last panelist, and they're subject matter experts, they're friends, they're just, they're really great people. This is Matt Bunch. Many of you know Matt already. Uh, as the horticulturalist for the Giving Grove since 2013, Matt selects the fruit and nut varieties, <clears throat> consults with new sites, and advises the more than 230, 230 Giving Grove sites on best practices for growing fruits and nuts biologically in the Kansas City area. He is also national horticulturalist for the Giving Grove. Matt has been in the horticulture profession since 1994, but his love for plants and gardening grew from the vegetable gardens of his parents and grandparents. Schooled as a history major, and if you have a conversation with Matt, you will absolutely know that, Matt has worked in horticulture in retail, municipal, and public garden capacities. From 2004 to 2013, Matt was with Powell Gardens, Kansas City's Botanical Gardens, first as the Native Plant Landscape Specialist for the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center, and later as the Horticulturalist for the Heartland Harvest Garden, a 12-acre edible landscape featuring over 2,000 distinct edible plant varieties, fruits, nuts, berries, vegetables, and herbs. So I don't need to tell this crowd. As you can see, our experts are experts. So we will get right to our questions. Oh, we have such good, we have such great viewers. Thank you, viewers. Uh, we'll look at the chat too. Looks like some of you have put questions in the chat. If you can migrate those over to the Q&A, that would help this um, tech, tech um, challenged person. All right, so first question from Laura Moreland. What HP is needed for the drill to use an auger? What supplier auger did you find most useful? And I think that's going to be for you, Sarah. I think they're talking. She's talking about the the auger on that picture. Yeah. Um. So I have to say that's not a technique that I've used before, and I don't know if many of you saw that Matt um, chimed in in the comments there. Um. And looks like maybe he has some more experience or or input on that. I know that some of my colleagues really like to use those. It looks like somebody else is um, commenting in the chat about uh, Benjamin Vote. Um, having some recommendations there. Um, it's something that I've seen other people do um, when I have been involved in plantings that were large enough that you might need that sort of thing. We've been lucky enough to have a large group of volunteers so we can all just do it the old fashioned way. 
Matt, what's your experience? What horse? Yeah, I, I would just caution against uh, soil type and using an auger because when you use an auger, that it's that spinning force that ends up compacting the walls of the hole. And so, let's say you're putting in this, but even though be it a native plant and these have strong roots, et cetera, et cetera, these have also been babied along in a nursery. Uh, in a greenhouse for you know the past six months probably so they don't have these really strong roots to actually get out and break through some of the clay and the other thing that the clay does too is it will hold water in so you get you water your plants in after that you get a rain after that you end up having uh, all of that standing water which when you don't have much of a root system to start with that standing water can can really uh, hurt and even kill those new plants. So, you know, if your soil type is, is nice and loamy, no problem uh, using an auger, but uh, know your soil type, I guess, before you, before you dig. Know before you dig. It's great advice. That's really great advice. Last year, we did a big project um, where we planted some trees and the soil was so um, compact. The, the soil was like, unusually junky clay and we lost some trees because we were watering on what would normally be a good routine but I think the trees were sitting in water and and they hated that so uh great great advice sometimes sometimes we just have to go out and get make a relationship with that soil don't we to to really know how to how to do it Great. Thank you. That's great information. So Holly asks, you mentioned getting rid of winter creeper. Do you have any suggestions on the best way to do that? It's so aggressive and keeps trying to come into my yard. Holly, you ask a great question. Million dollar, maybe. Roberta, have you dealt with that? I, I have. I'm, I'm going to say something that will probably make people hate me but um yeah we had quite a bit of it in our yard and it was um you know typical like screwing up a fence and attaching and up trees and in a very large area as a ground cover and um <clears throat> I just paid one of my housemates to pull it and she, and you know she, in lieu of rent and she did a great job and it and it worked like I rarely see it but then a couple of years ago, I always gather everybody else's leaves in the neighborhood and I just dump them in my yard. And somebody had cleaned out a bunch of winter creeper and ended up with a bunch of like seeds like distributed all over the place. Nice. And so these last couple of years, I've had to like just notice when I'm weeding, which isn't that much anymore for me, um, the little babies, because though those seeds are very um there's a reason it's a weed <laughs> so really? you know I mean I know there's other ways so you know you can you can spray it and stuff but I my, my preference is not to do that because of the soil damage and so you know it's a lot of work but you can kind of get in there and you got to get the mama plant you know that the one that was like deeply rooted and is making all those babies and spreading out supporting the rest of the family mm -hmm. constant uh -huh. vigilance constant vigilance yeah that's would, great go ahead Matt well, I, I would also add to this that you know many of our neighbors have winter creeper uh it's in many fence lines birds do eat the berries and so really that's kind of the main transmission and so if you have your garden underneath the canopy of trees well you will probably have winter creeper and I think the key in this, you know, Sarah in the presentation really you know, said this multiple times is, is know what these seedlings look like so things do not get out of control. And a seedling winter creeper stands out like a sore thumb right now. It's, it's very, I mean, it may only have two sets of leaves, but I could see it a hundred yards away. So uh, it's, it's, you know, become very familiar uh, with, with what these look like in their various stages. And if you can just identify a few invasives, the, you know, just focus on a few and then deal with those, then a, a lot of times you don't have to worry about everything. Just focus. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, Autumn Joy Clematis really stands out now too. And that for me oh. is just going to be, a, it's because it was historically let go in my yard, like encouraged. It's going to just be an always be a problem and it chokes everything to death. So um, I just always have to, that's just part of my landscape. And I always have to be aware of the babes. Sometimes I miss them and then they go up and start choking a shrub and then I see it and I I pull it out. But this is a great time of year to notice those. Yeah, <clears throat> great. Victor asks, asks a really great question. Victor asks, what kind of plants provide stem nesting opportunities? And I'll just throw it out to any one of you. I know you all know. Um, so I think some of my favorites to have that also provide that are things like um, Joe Pieweed. Um, there are several milkweeds that they will use. Um, those are the ones that come to mind, right? Oh, Monardas. Um, Matt or Roberta, do you have favorites? I, I would also say Liatris, you know, those oh, yeah. are nice, nice, big, thick stems. And, and I think we all agree that Liatris are, are very beautiful in the garden. Uh, some of the taller goldenrods, like stiff goldenrod has a has a nice fat stem. And really it's it's that diameter of stem that that's really going to be uh, what what those insects are liking, something that they can they they can lay an egg in, uh, raise a brood or a single larva in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rattlesnake master as well. Nice, oh great. Nice, nice strong hollow stem. We have a, a great question from Daniel, but I will acknowledge I don't understand what the acronym is. So whoever takes this, tell me what the acronym means. It, from Daniel, it was in the chat, are we encouraging people to feed birds with HPAI as an economics concern in the spreads to other non-avian species? So I'm going to fully expose my ignorance. I don't know what HPI, HPAI is. So that's referring to avian influenza, but I will tell you, I'm not sure okay. what the H and P are. Highly pathogenic. Thank you, Stacia. Highly pathogenic. Um, oh, great, great. Thank you. Makes sense. Um, and as a couple of people pointed out in the chat, um, so if you raise, you know, if you have domestic birds or you have chickens or something like that, then then yes, you probably would want to reconsider whether you're feeding birds. Um, there is currently no recommendation against doing so for people who don't have that specific concern. I'm not sure how much of a problem it is if you're local to Kansas City in our area. I think in some areas of the country it's worse and some it's better, but I'll admit I'm, I'm ignorant uh, as far as the specifics on that. Um, but the, the thing that that question kind of brought up for me is what a great reason to focus on providing bird food and bird resources through your native plants rather than, you know, rather than feeding if that's something that you're you know that you're more concerned about and that's a valid concern that's great thank you thank you for explaining what that meant too because i i um if you've been around long enough you've got acronyms from every facet of your life and they start to overlap a little bit so um becky asks i have a patch of non-native giant reed grass that i want to kill how successful is it to cover and try to suffocate or solarize it with cardboard and mulch? That's a good question, Becky. I'm just going to throw it out to any one of you. I think we're muted. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess how big is the patch first off, because I would actually be inclined to dig it out um, because I don't believe anything like uh, cardboard. Uh, I mean, cardboard, yes, if you provided many, many layers of cardboard on this and tried solarizing, perhaps, but as soon as you and, you know, I, I think you would have to do this for easily a full growing season. Uh, but honestly, if if it's not too big of a patch, I would just dig it out. Um, I, I think the, the solarizing, you will not end up killing everything by the time you're ready to plant again. Uh, and then Karen in our chat kind of chimed in. Karen says, I killed mine by digging and cardboard. Look at that. So we love when we have 
experts in the audience too. That's great. Um, all right. Hunter asks, and this is a common, really common. Hunter wants first to say great info and thanks. And I would definitely ditto that. Uh, yellow aphids seem to enjoy my swamp milkweed last year. Is there an environmentally friendly way to control these and similar uninvited guests? And I kind of enjoy them, but I'm going to let you guys chime in. Yeah, I'd say that let them let them be. It's uh, it's all part of the magic of uh, of the way they work, and so. Um, I learned uh, as I'm investigating like this very question myself, I learned that ants actually have a symbiotic relationship with them and like take them into their nests at night and then put them back. And it's this whole cool thing what? That's in the cycle with aphids and ants. And, you know, I have gotten ladybugs because I, I have a, um, a wild plum that can get aphids. It's kind of in a stressed out place. Mm -hmm. And I have done that. And I just noticed they just actually there. If you see a bunch of aphids, you're going to see a bunch of ladybugs too. So yeah. I leave them be. I mean, I think it, they look scary, but I, it, it, you know, they seem to coexist well on milkweed anyway. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I, you know, I, I get the whole, uh, it's aesthetically the aphids. I mean, with with a lot of milkweeds, with swamp milkweed, with common milkweed, uh, yeah, they they can certainly take over. Uh, but yeah, I totally second uh, what Roberto was saying because uh, yeah, you when you have aphids, you will have ladybugs, and it's the ladybug larvae that do most of the eating of the aphids. Uh, the other thing is you'll have uh, green lace wings. And green lace wings are another one of those predator insects that, uh, and their larvae actually look kind of similar to ladybug larvae too. And so they'll just uh, also mow down the aphids. So uh, the aphids are, are almost an indicator that you will have more biodiversity. And, yeah. and, and yes, uh, you do have the ants that are raising the aphids uh, much the way a rancher. I mean, that's sort of the analogy there. They're ranching the aphids. Uh, they're they're sort of living off. Uh, well, the aphid excrement uh, is actually what they're living off of. So, um, but if you can't stand that whole system happening, uh, a little bit of water, uh, just kind of hose them down. That will end up mm -hmm. drenching uh, a lot of those aphids. And the aphid buildup really happens when we uh, when we don't have decent rains. Uh, you'll you'll see that their populations really boom because they're not getting washed off. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we are out of time for questions. Um, thank you, Sarah and Matt and Roberta. You guys have been tremendous. Karen asks one last question, and I believe we have, I think I have a good resource. She just wants us Sarah, do we have a good link in those resources for identifying seedling native plants? I believe there is a link there to an yeah. MDC publication, um, which, yep, the one that you're holding. Yeah. Um, I don't know of um, similar resources for um, woodland or shade species. They may exist, and I, um, if Matt or Roberta have any... I have not been able to find one, but that one, the little, the, the, the little one, that one, I think might also have a USDA label on it, but I found that online in a PDF format. Yeah, it's online as well. Okay. So we'll make okay. sure. Yeah, thank you. It's not MDC. Make sure it is MDC. MDC, is it both? NRCS and Grow Native did, did this booklet. Um, so we'll make sure, Karen, thank you for the, the um, ask because we'll make sure it's a great it's a great resource to know, especially in this early spring uh, when we're trying to, to make sure. Uh, thank you all. Um, thank you all so much. Oh, Laura Moreland also chimes in. Great point. Going to plant sales also teaches you about what native seedlings look like because they are just up. So now for the, I'm going to close out. Thank you for sticking with us, everyone. Thank you, Matt, Sarah, and Roberta. You guys are like the goats. So, you know, this was a great way to end this amazing series. 
Uh, I'm going to close out uh, with a few announcements for our for our audience. I'm going to share my screen real quick. We have some exciting things going on. So first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for being here um, and let you know about a few things going on with Deep Roots. Native Plants at Noon occurs every third Thursday of the month. This month on the 16th, we are going to return to the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. We haven't been there since 2022. So we're all excited to see Alex and Sydney there and see what these two native plant sweethearts have in store for us. So please join us on the 16th. Wanted to also let you guys know that we are dispatching a new program from Deep Roots called Nature Advisors. Uh, this has two, two opportunities for our viewers. If you are looking for someone to come to your, uh, your home, your garden, and give you kind of put you in the right direction, um, just get you to the next step, Nature Advisors is for you. Or if you are someone who has a passion for native plants, we would love to have you as a nature advisor volunteer, someone who actually goes out and helps folks get to that next step. So that's nature advisors. Uh, it's on our website, little information, ways to sign up. So we would love to have you join us there. Next month, we are going to start preparing for the upcoming spring season. We are going to talk about removing the inv invasive calorie pear tree and why you should it is a it is a um it is a metropolitan and i'd say statewide on kansas missouri and many other lower midwest states it is a it is an invasive uh, beast that is taking over natural wildlands grasslands roadsides um and we we have we have some ways to get rid of it so we would love to have you join us next month for that and to close, to finally close out um, all of our events, all of the things going on, you can find at deeproots.org slash events. While you're there on our website, we would, if you'd consider making a donation, we would be so grateful. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for sticking with us with this series. The series uh, attendance grew every single week, so we know it was really impacting you. And We'll see you in a couple of weeks for Native Plants at Noon. And in the meantime, remember what you plant matters.